There are a number of Bind and Fly drones available, all based around the DJI and HD0 systems. What's been very apparent, though, is the lack of Bind and Flies based around Avatar HD from Cadex. Today, though, that has changed because Cadex have released their own first Bind and Fly model featuring the Avatar HD system built in. Not only is it the Avatar HD system, it is the very best that Avatar HD has to offer based around their new Moonlight VTX kit, which is trying to compete directly with the likes of DJI 03. Now, what I'm going to do today is give you my overview and review of this drone. They have sent me this to review. This is a retail version. Yes, this video is later than many of the others out there because I literally only just received this. However, what I'm going to do is share with you my thoughts and tell you if I think Cadex have done a good job. Now, just to be crystal clear, Cadex FPV did send me this drone for free. However, they have not paid me to make this video. They've not seen this video before it's been published. And as always, my thoughts are entirely my own. Okay, so I'm not going to waste too much time on the unboxing on this. But what we have here is the Cadex own bind and fly. So they have designed and built this quad in house. And as I've said, it is based around the Avatar HD Moonlight VTX. Now, this is the retail kit. So what you're seeing here is what you get in the box. There is a USB cable for updating the firmware. There is some additional props. We have the drone itself, which we'll take a look at in a second. We have an ND filter, the same one you get with the Moonlight kit. You have that little upgrade cable for firmware that you get with that Moonlight kit as well. Battery strap, some extra screws, and then right at the bottom, a quick start guide as well. Okay, so to walk you over the GoFilm 20 in a bit more detail, it is a 94 mil wheelbase cine whoop or three and three quarter inch, depending on which way you want to measure it. It features a composite top plate with the motors are mounted to, and then you've got a plastic duct that goes all the way around. And that's what also houses the electronics here in the bottom. You can see there that the duct goes all the way up and it actually goes all the way here to the bottom around where the camera is. Now, this drone is based on what they're calling their Super F405 HD AIO. It supports up to 20 amp 4-in-1 ESC. It has the STM32 F405 SOC and it has the ICM42688 gyro. It does also have Express LRS built in as well. However, it isn't SPI, it is UART based and it is upgradable, but you also have an external antenna for that as well, which is located at the back there, which should really offer some really good range. Now, as I've said, the digital system in this is obviously Avatar HD, and they've decided to go with their high-end Avatar HD Moonlight VTX and camera kit. So you've got that full VTX capable of up to 4K 60 frames a second, and then you've got that Avatar camera for that as well, located up front. This is all soft mounted. You can see there that they've got this soft mounting mechanism inside the quad there, which should help keep vibrations away from the camera. And you also have the ability to install that ND filter on the front as well, which should not only offer a bit of extra protection for the camera, but it will help you with filming as well. Now, the build on this quad is really, really clean when I look at it. Everything has been well thought out. So, for instance, we've got our XT30 connector on the back here. Battery-wise, it is designed to be used with 4S packs up to 650, 750 milliamp hour. It's going to be your choice depending on the weight you want to go with, but it will take a 4S pack there. We've then got our two antennas here for our Avatar HD system, which go down into the VTX. And there's easy access to pretty much everything you need to get to. So for instance, access to the SD card on the side of the Moonlight is nice and straightforward. Access to the firmware upgrade port there as well is okay. If I spin it around to that side, access to the bind button is good too. And with regards to the AIO, the USB port is buried just down in there. Not the easiest to show you. I will put some B-roll up, but it is 
fairly easy accessible. I think Cadex have put a bit of thought into how easy it is to get to stuff because what you can often find on quads like this is whilst they're really nice and well made and compact, getting to the I.O. can be a challenge. Now motorwise, these are fitted with Cadex branded 1303 6000 KV units. They are gold in colour. They have a black label around the outside. You can then see there we've got team out props on the top and then we've got our windings underneath. I can't say what the motors are like with regards to longevity but quality wise so far everything looks good and again I've got no complaints there at all. Now, as I mentioned, the AIO in this is based off the STM 32F405, and that comes pre-installed with Beta Flight as standard from the factory. That isn't to say you couldn't install any of the other flight stacks if they were compatible with this controller, but here and now, it's designed to work with Beta Flight. Now, there is no other additional sort of bells and whistles on this drone like you might find on something like the DJI Avata or the Avata 2. There's no GPS here. doesn't have any of the advanced return to home or battery safety features but what it does do is give you full freedom and it gives you all of the options that you may want around what you would come to find in the likes of beta flight and that's what we'll take a look at a bit more later on. Now, if you're not familiar with the Avatar Moonlight kit that comes installed on this drone, it actually has a lot of really nice features. For instance, the camera is based around their starlight sensor with a maximum field of view of 160 degrees and an aperture of f2.1, and it does a really good job of giving you good day and low light footage. That is coupled to their Moonlight VTX kit. It is a VTX and DVR in one. I actually have a teardown of this if you're interested in seeing it in my review view. Early versions did have some issues, but the final version that we've got here is absolutely fine. It does have a built-in SD card and you can actually record up to 4K 60 frames a second directly onto that SD card in a bitrate as high as 150 megabits a second. There are some limitations with regards to the recording rates depending on the latency mode. So for instance, if you use it in the lowest latency mode, it is going to limit the recording frame rate. However, you can record in the higher latency mode and get the higher recording resolutions. Weight-wise, if we pop it on the scales as it is here, it comes in at 117 grams without the ND filter, but with the battery strap fitted. Obviously, the final takeoff weight is going to vary depending on your pack of choice. As I said, it's designed for up to 4S, 650 milliamp hour. You can use it on 2 to 4S though, so you have a choice of what sort of weight class you want to put yourself into when using this quad. Okay, now one of the things I want to do is just do a quick tear down to have a look, but also see how easy it is to replace the duct on this quad, because this is something that most people are going to end up having to do, and it's worth understanding how difficult the process is. Now, looking around it, we've got screw here, screw here. We have one here and one here one here at the back, and I think that is going to be it for taking the duct apart. The duct has the whole bottom shell attached to it. The Moonlight VTX is attached to that as well, so we're going to need to be careful. What we are also going to want to do is pop our antennas out as well, so I'm going to do that first. So that should allow that to free. There is a plug from the look of it that goes under the... You can't quite see it, but it is under the plastic duct there. And that goes into the flight controller down in that gap there, which we'll take a look at in a minute. And that goes down to the Moonlight VTX. Hopefully, that is the only thing we're going to need to undo. Although I've just spotted that the camera is actually mounted, I think, to the top plate. So we may end up with the cable coming along on that. Let's, let's take it apart and see. So... We're going to undo that screw there. That's one. We'll also check to see if they're all the same or if there are any differences on the screws. I'll let you know that as we move through. Those two are the same. That one there is for this camera plate that's attached to the top. So actually, you probably want to undo that one because that's going to release the camera and allow it to follow the bottom plate. That's the same screw again, so we're okay. Let's do these two on the front. Same length. Oh, something comes off when we undo that, so we will need to monitor that and make sure that they go back in. Yeah, same length. 
So on the front, there's these two little TPU pieces, like these little bumpers. They go between the bottom shell and the top plate, so you're going to need to be careful with them. And then the final screw I'm going to undo is this one back here. Same length. So all of the screws are the same length, which is good. That way you don't have to worry too much about it. And if, it, if I'm right, in theory now, we should be able to separate the bottom from the top if I'm right. And I say if. There we go. It starts to come free. You can see the camera is wobbling around down there. And then what I'm going to do is just unplug that connector. That is located there. I'll just put some footage up so you can see that a bit closer. There we go. So if I now just unplug that connector there, there we go. That's released. And that is the top and the bottom separate. So getting the duct off this is actually fairly straightforward. That's not that difficult to do. So if you did want to change this duct at this point, the only thing you're going to need to do is undo those four screws, remove the Moonlight VTX, and then you're ready to go. That's really quite straightforward. Now we're in here, that gives us a better look at our AIO. So you can see there we've got our STM32F4 in the middle. We've got our ESP32 and our Express LRS antenna coming over here. A little bit of glue there to hold it in place. You've now got a good view of that built-in capacitor, as well as our battery wires going to the board as well. And as I have mentioned several times, Cadex have done a really nice job on the packaging on this quad. I really, zero to complain about at all. Really good. Something else that's rather interesting looking on this AIO is there is a barrow sensor there. Was not expecting that. I don't remember seeing that in the spec. I could be having a brain fart right now. However, just so you know, there is a barrow sensor included there too. So you're going to have the altitude hold modes if your flight stack obviously supports it available too. Not going to have the DJI level of that, but you do have the barrow. Now, as I did mention earlier about the only downside is the motor wires are soldered directly to the board here. There's no plugs, not particularly unusual. Plugs offer a benefit and a downside. They take up space, they add weight. However, they do make replacing motors a little bit easier. If you did want to replace a motor on this, you are going to need to unsolder those wires, but they don't particularly look that difficult to get to. Now, as this is bind and fly, all we should need to do with this to get it working is bind it to our radio, check a few things work as expected, and then we should be ready to go. And that's what we're going to take a look at next. Before I do that, though, I just want to stress something. And I say this in all of my bind and fly drone reviews. Do not update the firmware on this quad unless you know what you're doing. I'm not talking about Express LRS. I am talking about beta flight. These drones come pre-configured from the factory with what the manufacturer believes is the best tune. Unless you know exactly what you're doing, do not touch the firmware with regards to doing updates. Configure beta flight in the way you may need to do it. However, there is no need to touch anything else. You simply need to make sure all of the options are working as expected and then try it out. Don't confuse things and risk issues by updating the firmware and losing the factory settings because you're only going to give yourself more problems than it probably solves. Now, the first thing we're going to do on the configuration is bind it to my transmitter. We're going to do that with Express LRS. The receiver on this does come with version 3 Express LRS pre-installed. It says 3.0. I'm not exactly sure if it's 3.0 or one of the variants, but because it's version 3, it will work with my transmitter out the door. Now, my preferred way to do Express LRS binding is via Wi-Fi, and I'm going to show you how to do that on this drone next. Okay, so what I've done is plugged a USB cable into the flight controller connection there. And what I'm going to do next is plug it into a power source to get it to power up. And then we'll get the receiver to enter the Wi-Fi mode. So if I just reach over and put it into my bench top supply, you then should see if I flip it over, we've got some LEDs kicking in. You can see that there's a flashing red one down there slowly. 
and then there is another LED somewhere else on the flight controller that will light up as well as a green one. But what we're waiting for is for this to enter the Wi-Fi mode. Now that will take usually about 20 seconds. So I'm just gonna pad for time. There we go, I'm gonna keep that there. And what you should see is this go from a slow flashing waiting to bind to a fast flashing and that then will tell me that the receiver on board the AIO has entered binding mode. There we go, if I show you there, you can now see that the LED is flashing rapidly. So what I'm going to do next is plug my Wi-Fi adapter into my PC. If you've got a PC you're using this on that doesn't have Wi-Fi, you're not gonna be able to do it this way, or you could just use a laptop, but I'm just going to use my desktop with a USB Wi-Fi adapter. What I'm gonna then do is go down to the bottom, find my Wi-Fi options for network, and there you should see the Express LRS receiver show. If you've not seen this before, it should show Express LRS RX. If you click on it and it asks you for a password, the password is Express LRS. As I have already connected to many Express LRS receivers before in the past, it's going to show up absolutely fine. What it will simply do is connect and then it will probably pop open my browser and then we need to go to the IP address of the receiver. There we go, it's connected. And what I've then done in my browser is gone to the IP address of 10.0.0.1. And this has taken me to the home page of my Express LRS receiver. Here we can see that the firmware on this is actually version 3.0.1. We can see down here some of the other settings. What I want to check is that model match is actually turned off before we go any further. There we go, it is brilliant. And then what I want to simply do is put in my binding phrase, the same one I use for all of my test gear, and then save and reboot. There we go. And then when it reboots, it should connect directly to my transmitter. Okay, so if I power it back up, what I'm gonna do this time is actually plug it into my computer's USB port rather than my power supply. It should then connect to the radio. I saw the radio receiver LED on this flash once and then go solid and that indicates that it has connected. I don't have the warning messages enabled on my radio on purpose a minute, but it does show that it is connected there. So what we're gonna do next is open Betaflight Configurator and make sure that it has all connected as expected. So now I'm in Betaflight Configurator. If you don't have this, you can download this from the Betaflight website. I will put a link to that in the description. If I then just do some checks, we just reset the axes just to make sure that they are exactly where we expect them to be. There we go. So if I tilt the drone back, yeah, that's fine. Forward, left, and right. So the initial configuration is correct. What we're going to do next is check my receiver has actually connected. Make sure that's looking correct. So I've moved my throttle. You can now see that the throttle is moving up and down as expected. Your is working. Pitch forward, pitch back, roll. Brilliant, my RC is working as expected. Now, this drone comes pre-configured from the factory with regards to PID tuning, OSD, and overall mode and switch setup as well. I don't intend to change anything on this other than the switch setup and make sure that aligns with my radio. So for instance, all of this is configured. If I go under the configuration tab, all of this should be preset up, ready to go. If we then go into PID tuning, the settings are already done. There is no need to change anything here out the factory. As I've shown already, the receiver works. So the only thing I really wanna check is the modes. I wanna make sure that my switches align to the switches that they've preset at the factory. You can see here that we do have our arm We've got our angle and horizon preset. They've got the beeper setup and turtle mode. So that is all preset up. So what I do need to do is just make sure everything is correct. So the first thing I'm gonna do is check my arm switch. There we go. We can see it's preset to AUX1 as it should be for Express LRS and that is working fine. What probably isn't correct though is my mode switch. So let me just check mine. That isn't doing anything, that isn't going there. I think mine is actually AUX4, so what I'm just gonna do very quickly is reconfigure it, set that to auto. There we go, you can see that that has been configured onto AUX4. I'm going to personally turn off horizon mode. I don't use it. You can have it set up if you want it on the drone. 
I don't personally want it, so I'm going to take that away and click save. We're just going to check that we also have our range in the correct position for angle mode as well. There we go. That is correct. And then the next thing we just need to check is our beeper. So again, that isn't matching what's on here. So I'm going to set to auto. There we go. Aux 8 is my beeper, which goes to the middle. And I'm going to move that to the middle there and click save. And then I'm going to go down further, set this to Aux 8 for our flip over over crash. There we go. That's now set correctly. Click save. And then that's my transmitter set up and ready to go. Now, the OSD on this drone also comes pre-configured. There is no need to change anything particularly, although I am going to move one or two things around. It's always my personal preference to have my battery voltage in the bottom middle area of the display. I don't particularly like my battery voltage off to the side. Just going to get that there exactly where I like it. But other than that, everything else looks OK, so we should be good to go. Now it was time to take it out for a few flights. This initial flight is a shakedown test flight to make sure that the aircraft works as expected. I always take a brand new aircraft to the test field. I literally just move it around the field, just making sure that we're not gonna get a motor come loose, prop fall off, fall out the sky for any strange reason. More than anything, it's to make sure I get a feel for how the quad flies, but also, it is actually performing as expected. Now, I have to say, out the box, it flies fairly well, actually. It was quite windy here today, so it wasn't the ideal test weather. Overall, as you can see here, this is being recorded in 4K on the onboard DVR. This isn't stabilized, though. This is just the straight footage, so it does give you all of the bumps and all of the moving around. And actually, it is fairly stable, considering that it isn't stabilized, too. Now, just to give you some proper footage from this quad, the weather here hasn't been great, but I did manage to get one nice day and I took it down the beach once the weather had dropped off, although there was still a little bit of wind. Here, you're seeing the footage again from that moonlight camera recorded in 4K 60 frames a second, and this has been stabilized in Gyroflow. And what I just wanted to do is demonstrate just how this camera can look. The sun is going down here so this image is quite contrasty but actually this moonlight camera does a good job so i'll let this continue to play and then i'll come back and share with you some thoughts
Now, one last thing I just want to show you is actually related to the Avatar HD system. And it's just one of the annoyances that I still have. Now, I was just coming around here on one of the test flights, and you'll notice now that I go straight through the gap between those two branches. And that went straight forward, no problems at all. Reality, though, in the goggles was quite different. And as I come through here, you'll actually notice I don't see the branches to the last minute. And if I just show you this again in slow motion, you'll actually see that I didn't know those branches were there. I was just heading forward here. At this point, there is no visibility of the branches at all, and they actually don't appear to the last second, and I happen to go straight through the center. More luck than judgment. And it's just one of those annoyances that I do still have with the Avatar HD system. We have that mushy behavior that's still there, and it's still something that does affect in very green situations like you see there at the test field. One last bit of footage I just want to show you is some goggles footage from my beach runs earlier. This just shows the difference between how it performs at the field and how it performs here. On places like beaches, bright areas, it's absolutely fine. It's just these very green repeating pattern areas that it really does struggle with. And whilst you wouldn't want to use the goggles DVR footage as your main output, it still gives you an indication of how it looks and what I was seeing through the goggles. Now, price-wise, the GoFilm 20 comes in at $399. Now, I know up front that is going to sound a lot of money for a small whoop like this, but do take into account all of the digital whoops and cine whoops in this category are all around that price. You're paying a premium for a digital system here. You've got that built-in Moonlight DVR and VTX, and as a result of that, you are paying a price for that included in the kit. If you were to take the cost of that out, it does drop the craft down to a much more sensible price. And whilst you may see a lot of these much cheaper, you're going to see analog versions. If you want a good digital one with either Avatar HD or the likes of DJI 3, you're going to be paying around this price. As for my thoughts on the craft itself, overall, I actually think Cadex have done a very, very good job here. They've clearly put a lot of thought into the design, and I can close to not fault them for anything on the craft itself. There are only a couple of little things that do bug me. Number one, it's a shame that they don't include a second duct in with the kit. I'm going to complain about this about any manufacturer who doesn't do this on a whoop or a cine whoop. There should be a spare plastic duct included in the kit. If you break it, and it is inevitable that you will break one of these ducts, it is always good just to have one spare, and I'd like to see all of the manufacturers stick a spare in with the box. Obviously, Cadex are not at this time. And about the only other few little things that I would query about is the fact that the tune is almost there. It's not perfect. I would like to see a little bit more expo on the throttle as well as a couple of other little tweaks. That's just preference and anyone can do that when they buy the quad. But when I do get a quad that is sort of aimed for new users or people entering the industry, I do like to see things a little bit more mushy, just set up slightly less hardcore for those users. It isn't bad. I just think out the box, it would be just a little bit easier for new users to fly with a bit more expo here and there. About the only real downside I'll mention on this quad, and it isn't the quad itself, it's the Avatar HD system in the sense of it really still isn't where we are with the likes of DJI 3 and nowhere near where we are with DJI 4 and the Avatar 2. I'm not saying it is designed to be and it's not right to compare this to the Avatar 2 because they are very different quads. But you do still have some of that quirkiness with the Avatar HD system live view as you saw in some of the footage I showed. The mushiness, the way it sort of skipped that branch. This is stuff that just lets the Avatar HD system down a little bit for me. The DVR footage from this Moonlight VTX is actually very, very good, and it stabilizes well too. It's not 03 good, and it's not 04 good, what you see on the Avatar 2 or DJ 03, but it is decent enough, and I think it's good enough 
for someone who doesn't want to fly with a GoPro or an action camera on board, and it does stabilize very well too. The only thing, as I've said, I just wish the Avatar digital system would be able to get rid of that mushiness that we see in the greens. There is some camera settings that can be tweaked that should help it. I need to do a bit more testing because I haven't done that for a while. But overall, that's probably the one weakness that we're still seeing here today. What's going to be interesting is what CADEX do with their next digital FPV system. As they've already hinted at with the Goggles X, it does have a replaceable module and it's some some point this year, they said mid-year, that we may be seeing a new version, and that is one of the things I really hope that they do improve. Overall though, considering this is their very first bind and fly, I actually think they've done a great job, and if you're interested in getting one, there will be a link to it in the description. That is an affiliate link, I will add, and I do use the affiliate link for CADEX, and if you're interested in supporting the channel, it is there, but if you don't, just go straight to cadexfpv.com, and you can order it there as well. Now, I want to say a big thank you to CADEX for sending this one over. It was supplied for free of charge. I'm really interested in knowing what you think about this as well. If you'd like to support the channel, there are also links to to Patreon as well as buy me a coffee in the description. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons for their support and if you'd like to support us please do consider checking it out. Anyway that's it from me. Stay safe. I will speak to you soon.